This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Canisher. Canisher Insurance Services creates insurance programs designed to grow and protect the cannabis industry. Their team of cannabis insurance experts are constantly innovating to solve the biggest coverage issues facing business owners and regularly seeks customer feedback to shape its programs. Canisher's Cannabis and Hemp program includes industry-leading property capacity up to $40 million and general liability up to $6 million. Because of these higher limits, the program is especially suited for multi-state operations and can write one policy to cover all operations. Additionally, Canisher offers brokerage services for specialty coverages, which include outdoor crop insurance to cover natural disasters, commercial auto insurance to cover delivery, and workers' compensation, and much more. If you're looking for a team that works tirelessly to help you grow, then contact Canisher at Canisher.com. That's Canisher.com. Canisher, insurance designed to protect and grow the cannabis industry. My friend, Rena Sherbel, welcome back. Welcome back. It's great to be back, my friend. It's great to be back. It's nice to, nice to see you live and not in person, but it's nice to see you live. <laughs> live and like we were talking about before, we recorded the new quality of video, which uh, just little steps to enhance the overall production value of the podcast. I mean, you can definitely relate being a podcast host of two podcasts now, so it's a it's Absolutely. a pro, it's a process right <clears throat> it, it's a process and you're hitting me i mean first of all anyone that's watching shout out to kevin for how fresh he looks with his new with his new <laughs> like technical advancements um you're catching me a few weeks off a huge snafu of my own that i did on the audio side of my cannabis investing podcast um i just this has happened to me once before but the outcome was not this which is I was not in my usual recording space. And I don't know about you, but my first lesson should be just don't ever record outside of your regular recording space because you just kind of, you know what to expect where you are, you know, like how to troubleshoot and how to navigate. And anyways, I was not in my, I was not in my home uh, studio and I had an interview with Ellen Brockstein and the conversation was oh, no. just like, it was so good. It was so awesome. And I was hearing him. Okay. It wasn't like crystal clear, but that has happened to me before. And then like the, the final product is like, fine, but this is just like jumbled. And I just learned a whole bunch of lessons. Honestly, I, the truth is I relearned a whole bunch of lessons <laughs> and anyone who knows me personally knows that I need to learn a lesson probably five times before it actually, uh, no, just kidding. It um, sometimes, sometimes that is true, but I, but professionally, I hope to only have to learn it once, but at the beginning, I mean, I'm just being very, very forthright as a podcast host. At the very beginning of starting the podcast, I feel like maybe I've talked about this before, but like my second episode, the audio wasn't right. And then I was like, okay, lesson learned is only my second episode. And then like, you know, everything was great. And then just like two weeks ago, two years into a podcast. So thankfully we have a transcript team and, and we kind of caught it, but I know it pissed a lot of people off. Um, I, I, I try and apologize as much as I can and make up for it, but uh, yeah, it sucks, man. It sucks to like have a, and also it takes away from like the quality of, you know, what's being given over, which I thought was just like pristine, perfect, cogent cannabis analysis. <laughs> um, and it's out there, but, but yeah, it's embarrassing and frustrating and, and ways to, ways to get better. So I hear you big time. I'm wanting audio, visual, everything to look good. And it is a, well, it's a constant work in progress because everything Definitely. is constantly being upgraded and different people coming on different methods, different ways, you know, and, and you can also control everything, right? Like you're talking no. to somebody else and like, you can't control what's going on there. And so I feel like there, there should be like a podcaster's handbook, like what to say when this happens, what to say when that happens, and then just totally like, internalize uh like a cheat lessons. a cheat sheet right like for a video yeah, game yeah. or something it's like uh, if this if the conversation goes this way uh right, <laughs> right. arrow right. up uh j and yeah if <laughs> if only but hey those snafus they only make us better and they keep us on our toes and they're bound to happen yeah. i'll share an example with yeah. you so uh, going again on the lines of of enhancing the production value of, of cannabinoid connect 
I got really, really brave and tried recording through like a studio software program and like really try like, you know, to start really getting more professional with it. And long story short, I had about 30 minutes to prep before the podcast took place. I, I practiced the night before and I thought I got it down. And, uh, the lady joined, we were starting our conversation and then it just completely like broke on me. So I had to re-engineer and go back to the old way of recording in mid conversation. So, uh, I think that I top top you there in terms of, uh, you know, being frazzled and, and, and having to adapt, but Hey, we'll survive. Right. That's what we do as podcast. We'll survive. Yeah. Well, that's a thing like mid frazzle. That's like, that's a whole thing because that you have to like, get yourself back. You have to like, look okay. You have to (laughs) not show the person that you're totally like out of your depths momentarily. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, there are so many things. It's funny, you know, like when I, started working at Seeking Alpha, you know, it was kind of like, it wasn't, I, you know, it w- I wasn't a news editor by any means, but it was a lot faster paced than like, you know, my writing was never news-based or fin- or anything based on kind of like real time is always like movie right. writing or journal, you know, it, it you was had never time. like that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Time constraints. So that's something I've learned, but seriously, like having your own show and needing to like you really just like sometimes have to like really be able to handle things like super super in the moment and and that's its own skill and that gets developed I think like any muscle any skill it needs to you need to screw it up before you uh, perfect it (laughs) for sure well then you got that basketball background right so I'm sure a lot of that translate quick quick decisions got to pass off the last play yeah yeah, Yeah. exactly so it it translates over well, it's so yeah. good to see you. I'm so excited. It's been too long. I know we said that we wanted to do this on a monthly basis and we were good about that for a while. And then of course, life gets in the way, work gets in the way, things get in the way. So it's been about what, two months? It's been over two months. Yeah, something months. like that. Wow. Yeah. 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 L- lots it's have been crazy going on. What's, fast flies. I know. What's been going on in your world? How's, how's everything been? <clears throat> It's good. It's good. I mean, I have to say, you know, like those memes, like my summer plans and then Delta variant, you know, it's like a little bit like I haven't had anything canceled. I've actually, I feel like I took a nice quick trip to, to the Greek islands, like right before the Delta variant was a thing. And so it was like just enough time to feel like, oh, like, okay, this is a new normal, but it's like not that bad of a normal. And then I came back home and I was like, oh yeah, it's back to being a crappy normal again. We're back. Yeah. I think a lot of my summer is spent, first of all, I'm like working really hard and intensely on getting the CEO interview show kind of like, I mean, it's off the ground. It's video interviews with CEOs of publicly traded companies. So spending a lot of time just like figuring out best practices, different iterations of things we're trying to do. It's so much like talk about like, you know, throwing a ball against the wall and like seeing how it comes back to you. Like, this works, this kind of, we slightly have to tweak this, this intro, you know, just like so many, it's like really building a start. You know, it's like, you could be working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it still wouldn't, you could still have more to do. Um, so I feel like I'm, I'm there with that, like super happy, super, like very passionate and energetic and, and super into that. And then on the other side, I feel like, it's like a struggle to kind of like, uh, yeah, yeah, everything's great. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, just like planning for next year. Like it's no big thing. Like seems like the world's pretty crazy. Like it is. Yeah. It's so crazy. My, my wife and I have a bet internally that, uh, if we're, if we're going into lockdowns again, or we're not, um, I'm on the side of, I think we are not to say that I want it, them to come. Of course not, but it just, it's just, insane. It, yeah, of course. Yeah, exactly. But it's just, <laughs> it seems like we're headed back down that path. And, you know, things are open still because it's summer, right? So like, right. you know, it's, it's warm weather. But I mean, I, I, if we look at last year of how things played out, it was kind of the same scenario, right? Things kind of started opening up again, summertime, but then September, October, once the fall and winter came, it was a different story. So hopefully we don't go that path. But you never know these yeah. days. You never know. Yeah. That's and really, the thing. You never know. You never know. And my advice, or at least what's helped me in my personal life, is just 
keep your head to the ground, man. You know, like yeah. stay focused, like whether it's a small project around the house or like a hobby or your job or whatever, like your kids, your family, do something to stay preoccupied so that you blur out all the noise that's out there. Because if you get caught up in that, you're in for a wild ride, you know? I agree. I agree. First of all, you need to like measure how much you're intaking of the noise. You know, I think small amounts at best. And I think you're right. I like in terms of keeping yourself busy, like for me, I, I say the same thing. I would like couch it as like perspective shifting, you know, like when I feel myself getting too crazed or like, is the world literally about to end? Is this it? You know, like when I feel myself getting to that place, I'm like, okay, we've hi. all been there. <laughs> yeah. Like look outside, call your, call your child, call your parent, call a friend. Yeah. It's just like you, I, it's, have to be in touch with that perspective i think otherwise it's it's really easy to to slide down that slippery slope Absolutely. um yeah that's why so, this yeah go ahead <clears throat> no i was just gonna say so speaking of like kind of like all these new things that we have going on i wanted to know like what you have going on in the two months that we like haven't spoken i feel like you have a bunch of stuff to to update me with my life is so busy right now it, it might be the most busy it's ever been since i've been alive and it's all good. It's all good. Because again, it's a, during a time of turmoil and craziness and uncertainty. So it, yeah. it, it gives me purpose. It gives me a reason to wake up and be happy with what I'm doing. So yeah, he, this is what I'm working on. So podcast, obviously, we're, we're rocking and rolling there. Um, I've, I'm also operating Cannabinoid Nation still. We've, we've kind of put a pause and we're kind of shifting our model a little bit to kind of see what really is our bread and butter when it comes to that business. So still operating, but kind of just re rethinking, retooling. My dad is running for mayor of the city that oh, yeah. I was raised in. So Sweet. yeah, he's very busy. And of course his family and friends are helping and supporting him with his campaign and then I just got a new wow. job, a full-time job. So hence why we're recording on a weekend on a Sunday. And I appreciate you being flexible to do that. But um, that has kind of, you know, changed uh, my scheduling a little bit. But I mean, those four things, in addition to living day to day and making my wife happy and the dogs happy and <laughs> everything else, you know, it's, it's good. Yeah. I can't complain, you know. <clears throat> Wow. That's a lot. That's a lot. First of all, your dad's running in New Mexico. Yes. Yep. He's for, for, for mayor. Did you say for mayor? Yeah. Small town just outside of Albuquerque called Belen. That's awesome. Is he pro cannabis? <laughs> he is pro cannabis. Yes. He is. And they just actually talked about cannabis ordinance laws because um, it's, it's not a matter of if they want it or not. Like the state basically the bill with the bill that they passed was no counties or municipalities can opt out. So, which yeah. is, I think is a really good thing because we saw in California that really caused a lot of complexity and confusion and, and just mm -hmm. more toll on the operator. So at this point, it's just more thinking about how do we regulate these biz businesses from an ordinance standpoint, zoning standpoint, and then like, you know, the, the police chief right thinking about um how to keep these businesses safe because it all comes back to no safe banking right so the fact that it's a cash business and you know it's a town that's kind of riddled with crime just kind of keeping those business owners safe and the product safe um in their establishments so it's it's interesting it's crazy that's really awesome has you are you like shocked that your dad's running for political office was that something you kind of could have predicted Yes and no. So like he he's definitely a guy that just doesn't sit around. He loves to be involved, especially within the community. So his whole background is like public service. I mean, he was a high school wrestling coach, middle school wrestling coach. He, he was on the city council. He was an HR manager for the city. He has federal government experience. So he's always been involved. I was kind of surprised that he decided to run like now. Um, but it just goes back to the fire in him, man, that, that Carrillo spirit, you know, he just can't, he can't let it go. So we're, we're, we're back, uh, back at him a hundred percent. We're proud of him. So that's cool. That's really awesome, man. It's nice to be able, especially in this day and age to have some optimism and want to like put your actions behind that. That's awesome. Very inspiring. 
Yeah, I was like, who? I mean, I think to myself, like, who would want to run for office in this yeah. day and age? Yeah. You know? Yeah. But I mean, he's a guy that he he really doesn't like in terms of digging up dirt or anything like that. He's he's got a really clean record just because of his thirty five years with the federal government and him always being audited and and neighbors being interviewed and things like that. So that standpoint doesn't really that's not a worry, but it's more of like you know, it's a big job ahead of him. So it's like thinking through yeah. like how to tackle those issues and what's the best angle and, and way to go about it. So it's all good. Yeah. You know, I'm happy. <laughs> and the other <laughs> thing, sorry, go ahead. No, you're good. Go ahead. No, I was going to ask you about cannabis. Cannab it's a hard word for me to say cannabis. Cannabis. I'm not saying it right. Can cannabinoid. Cannabinoid. Thank you. I was missing that <laughs> second end. Cannabinoid. Cannabinoid. Uh, cannabinoid nation, how, like, like in terms of iterating, you said like you're trying to figure things out, like big things or like how big things work. Like how how are you going about that? Not big things. So like we're 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 a startup, right? We're just starting in the industry, so we're not trying to bite off more than we can chew, but we're really trying to rethink like what solutions we really want to hone in on um to add value to the industry because we had third party partners before basically affiliate partners that we would kind of pass off work to which is fine but you know internally our team has a lot of core competencies especially on like the digital marketing side the website design side the e-commerce side so instead of coming out with everything so soon i think we're just going to kind of really hone in on our core competencies those kind of digital marketing aspects to this because that's really a need right now especially with all the red tape and regulation for advertising and marketing right i mean there's some brands that don't even do it just because they're fearful of being shut down so um we're trying to add value in that way uh and so, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, we're really thinking through our overall marketing year over year strategy, content plans. And if you want to do it right, you really got to set that foundation first before just going out and, uh, and just advertising, you know? So it's yeah. just kind of a, a pause button. Let's rethink what we're doing. Let's rethink our messaging. Let's really hone in our skill set and then go to market. So that's where yeah. we're at there. That's awesome. That's a lot going on, man. And that's a lot going on. It's crazy. But hey, like I said, it's all good. It gives me purpose to wake <laughs> up in the morning. And, and I love yeah. it. My full-time job is also related to what I've done all my life, a social media manager. So um, oh, working, nice. working for a nonprofit that does telemedicine, telehealth. So oh, that's awesome. they do really great work. You know, it's a very, very rewarding. So I'm blessed, Rena. I'm blessed. What about you? I mean, you got the CEO interviews. You got the Cannabis Investing Podcast. Yup, yup. I was just going to say, actually, we've interviewed a number of like uh, digital health providers, people that are in that space, like telehealth. Um, it's super interesting. I mean, there's so many new companies in that space. I feel like something I really love about CEO interviews, which is probably something that you love about your social, you know, like where you're working now, um, is kind of like being able to learn different things and then also kind of like expose other people to those different things. And like a lot of them are just like super helpful that I think like until you need it, you're not necessarily like thinking about. Exactly. But it's just, Yeah. Yeah, what's so interesting about my job being a social media manager for over a decade now with various companies is that it's it's so interesting to see conversations within those different lenses, right? Like like what are the what is the community like right. within the IT space? What is the industry right. like within the telecom space? What is it like right. within the telemedicine or even the cannabis space? And everyone's so different, <laughs> right? And their their ideologies, their you know, their the whole way they communicate, and it's just it's interesting to see it. I kind of get a peek into these different worlds and get to engage with these people from from the branded channels that I'm managing. You know, it's pretty cool. That's really cool. That's really cool. Well, let me ask you. This is this is selfish, but I think also for the people. What's your? I almost fell off my chair. What's your, um, <laughs> what's your kind of like main, main, like, I don't know, main advice or kind of like things that you feel like are best practices for like social media strategies or like something that you feel like people get wrong? There's two. So we'll talk about it from two perspectives. 
from the okay. individual personal perspective, don't fight with people on social media. Yeah, don't go back right. and forth. Like, aren't you don't... shocked when you see people doing that? Like public figures. I'm just like, it's happened where I'm like, what are you doing? What are what? you doing? You're, you're never going to win that battle ever, yeah, no. right? Especially if you're a public figure that has a lot of followers, a lot of people that listen to you. Like if you're going to engage with somebody else in the comments and go back and forth, yeah. that person has nothing better to do than to, right. to go back and forth with you all day long, right? And they're, they're wanting that. Like I always yeah. say, like, don't feed the trolls. And I didn't come up with that term, obviously. Like that's been around for a while, but it's so true. Like the more you feed them, the more they come at you, the more fuel you give them. You're, 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 you're letting them win at that point. So my advice yeah. personally, stay out of the comments, don't fight. Um, and then and add value. I always say add value, not noise, right? Like there's so much noise out there. So just be kind of thoughtful in what you're putting out there and wh whatever conversation topic it is, just, you know, just don't add to the noise for, for brands. I mean, that's the whole that could be a whole podcast in itself, but, but yeah. in its basics, it's like, you know, first, like understand who your audience is, right. Understand who you're talking to. And then from there, it's like really figure out what value you could add based off your business model and what you bring to the table through the industry. What are your differentiators? And then hone in on those, right? Like establish authority by providing thought leadership in those areas that you have expertise in um, and people will follow, you know, that's, that's really what it comes down to. If you're adding value, people will follow you, follow. It's that simple. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, I mean, honestly, like oh, a, a really big way that I learned those lessons and kind of like exactly what you're talking about is I feel like looking at, I mean, kind of segueing, bringing this back to, to the yeah. canvas space is feeling like the, the man, the CEOs, the executive teams that have that kind of like really forward thinking approach. And there's a few that like have it super strongly, like Ben Kovler of Green Thumb, like Kim yep. Rivers of True Leave, like their approaches on social media. And this is like predates, like, you know, I'm talking about like a few years ago already, like, or at least a couple years ago for sure. Um, like just how out there they were and how outspoken and how very, very forward facing they were. And for me, that taught me a lot about like, you really can stand for something and you really can put it out there. You don't have to be like literally every other person who's just like, blah, 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 blah. And just saying kind of cookie cutter statements that don't like necessarily like mean so much, but to really say something on the earnings calls, to really say something on social media and to kind of be a presence. Like if somebody tweets Ben or Kim or I'm, there's other examples, but like those are the two that really stick out in my mind. Like they answer them and they're not, answering trolls but they're like I remember somebody I can't remember the exact thing but it was something like somebody was saying something about maybe the number of stores truly have had and comparing it to somebody else in it in a kind of way and Kim like wrote back like that's false information this is the note you know just like it, there's such a great way to engage and like make yourself stick out and it's I feel like so I wouldn't call it easy because maybe it does, you know, there needs to be some authenticity behind that. And maybe not everybody has that. Um, but it does seem kind of like an easy win, you know, to kind of like get some nice positive sentiment from, from the people like via social media. It just seems like it's right there for everybody to do. And it's surprising to me that not everybody takes advantage of it as much as they can. It's that's such a good point you raise. And it, it actually it's it's the cannabis industry, in my opinion, is very unique in that the like you just mentioned, like the industry leaders, the Ben Kovlers of the world, the Kim Rivers, right? The Todd Harrisons, the I mean, everybody who's out there. I know Todd's not like I mean, he's he's more of a financial expert, but I'm saying all these people are very active on social media, especially Twitter. And I think it's very important, especially for this particular industry, because the education level is not there, right? The stigma is still associated with the plant. There's so many barriers that we need to break down of communication just to yeah. kind of get a seat at the table and have a conversation. And the more that we can use our platforms, our voices to put out that information and build a community, especially within Twitter, 
it's it's pretty remarkable and like you said like the like kim rivers and these 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 different ceos like they're all out there and they're actually managing their own channels in my experience working in other <laughs> industries that are very mature like it services or like i said telecom or even the medical field a lot of those executives don't want anything to do with social media they know that they need to be on but in some cases they're like hey just here's my login you manage it you do it like you yeah. and it seems like you know the industry leaders within cannabis are really taking the bull by the horns and they're like no like i'm gonna manage this it's my voice you know and i think yeah. that's very unique and very cool I think it's very unique and very cool, especially for the ones doing it well. I also, I also think that it really benefits them. I mean, I think it goes hand in hand naturally, but I think also just because of exactly what you said, like the lack of education, the huge stigma that still pervades, you know, anything around cannabis. Um, I think like, because it's such a retail investor industry right now, you know, it's, it's the, the, the desire and kind of the need is coming mostly from the retail space and not yet really strongly, slowly from the institutional space. I think that that kind of engenders the need for, you know, we need to engage people. We need mm -hmm. to educate them. We need to talk to them. We need to dialogue with them. We need to explain things to them. We need to put people out in dispensaries explaining things. We need to make sure our butt tenders are super, you know, knowledgeable, like all of those things that you need to do because that really behooves everybody involved, it behooves the investors, it behooves the executives, it behooves the company, like the stock price. And, and I think that's a lot of the reason why, you know, the cannabis industry right now is just like completely in, I mean, in, in, most, in most examples in total free fall um, or certainly in some kind of free fall mode. Right. Um, and, and I think a lot of it is just because like people are like, wait, but there was supposed to be federal legalization and now it seems like maybe nothing's happening. So no, <laughs> or, you know, like the cannabis stocks were like this and now they're like this. So no, you know, and it's just like, those aren't necessarily real things. I mean, they're obviously real things because they're happening, but it's like based on sentiment, you know? And so right. like, what is the real thing? What are the fundamentals? What are they reporting in earnings? What's their, you know, are they meeting guidance? Like those are actually what you should be focused on and if everybody was focused on that, cannabis stocks would still be like that, but it's not, and it's not the way, you know, investing works or the world works. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think like all of that kind of just like opening up the bag and explaining and exploring and, and, and feeding off of education instead of feeding off of fear and, you know, incomplete messaging. Um, yeah, I just, I, it's, it's the way to go. And also I think really serves literally everybody in the ecosystem. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a ripple effect. And it goes yeah. back to that importance of adding value and not noise because your actions by spreading noise could really harm and detriment the momentum that the industry is seeing or what's been happening. If you're not doing your due diligence and actually looking at the fundamentals or, or the, the earnings call, right. Or like understanding really where a company's at and just kind of putting out things that you think, or that you've heard from someone else that may not be a credible source. So it, yeah. it is important. And we have seen that play out in cannabis. The other thing that I think is really cool um, and unique about uh, the current state of like social media within cannabis is uh, the accountability. Like, I love that there are share shareholders out there on Twitter that will call out a company if their CEO is not on Twitter or if the, the company doesn't have a handle or, you know, so because it's starting to show, Hey, we're all out here. We're all being transparent. Why aren't you guys like, what are you doing? Yeah. You know? And, uh, and look, this is the world in which we're headed, right? I mean, more and more executives are getting a voice on these platforms and, and uh, that, that level of transparency needs to be there, especially when it comes to, to cannabis, which is the most highly regulated industry in the world right now. Right. So yeah. um, I like that. I see shareholders are really, you know, holding some of these leaders accountable that, that aren't out there, you know, that should be. Absolutely. I, I just read this article. Um, I'm blinking on his last name. It's something like Aaron Edelhart. He writes a lot about Glasshouse. I'm sorry that I'm blinking on his name. I, I think it's Aaron Edelhite. Um, but he's on Twitter and he writes a, a, like a lot about Glasshouse and Grand Ferraris and Santa Barbara and kind of Glasshouse along with, you know, the parent company and some California uh, companies have, have not been doing so well. 
And he wrote this whole piece about how, um, you know, with Glasshouse, there was like this issue with one of their greenhouses and it wasn't conveyed properly on their earnings call. And then there was no follow up kind of in either PR or on Twitter or something or a press release, you know, like there was nothing kind of put out there until like many days later. And by then the, you know, the, the share price totally took a dive. And he was saying, you know, like they're great operators, they're first time public operators. So it's something that they need to learn. And, you know, he, Aaron is super bullish on Glasshouse and, and the management team. Um, I, I feel like I am too, but he's, he, goes to explain like the reasons that he is. And he he feels like they'll get there, but I thought it was such a great point. Like exactly what you're saying, like saying, this is how you can kind of do it better. And I think the smart ones are taking that advice and doing it and and really kind of being it being reflected in how the company does subsequent to that. Absolutely. Isn't it so amazing too, to just see how fast this industry is just burgeoning ahead with, with the state adoption right the state level adoption and of course we're still lagging behind at the federal level but i mean like yeah. it's just like all gas no brakes i mean for a lot of yeah. these multi-state operators i mean is that kind of what you've uh experienced talking with all these industry leaders on your podcast it does seem like the way it's going i mean like the fundamentals of the best run companies look amazing you know like mm -hmm. what they're doing looks amazing and even Planet 13, which I've talked about on this podcast before, um, I, I'm not a direct shareholder, but I really believe in their story and their share price is not reflected in it, but they just reported some nice numbers like what's happening in Vegas since, you know, things have opened up again and um, that they've opened up cannabis consumption lounges in Vegas and what that means. So they're, I think, a really well-run company. Um they're not the same as like the big MSOs. It's a slightly different model, but yeah, I would say like, you know, uh, we were it's kind of to the point that we were just talking about of like kind of half read headlines or not fully understood headlines, like what's happening in New York and New Jersey. Like there was all this excitement about it going legal. And now there's like just a lot of pain points around working out the regulations around Cuomo's governorship, you know, like changing um, him needing to step down and like what that means for legalization. And a lot of people let's, are saying like, let's dive sorry. into that Rena. Cause I'm not, I'm not totally up to speed with that. So it is, is like the rollout of the legalization in New York being halted due to the transition of Cuomo and the new governor, like what's happening there. I think it's a great question. And I am not the person to kind of like be able to fully answer that. I feel like people probably understand it a lot more deeply than I do. But from what I've understood is, yeah, it's partly because of Cuomo and, and like what that means. And just in terms of like, he, everybody says that he was dragging his feet um, in terms of like actually letting it roll out. Like they signed the bill into law and to a lot of fanfare and then kind of putting pen to paper and putting those laws into practice. He was really dragging his feet on. Um, and so they say there's kind of like two, maybe one step forward, two steps back, or, you know, two steps forward, one step back. Um, I feel like with the new governor coming in, people have said it's going to take a little bit more time because, you know, transfer of this and the regulations and we need, but she's come out, Kathy Hackle, I, I believe her name is. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. Yeah. Um, I don't either. She, <laughs> she, uh, <laughs> she, she seems to be super pro cannabis and super, you know, not wanting to drag her feet and wanting it to, you know, kind of, go all gas, no brakes, you know, and, and put that. So people are, are a little bit like disappointed and frustrated with how it's been going. But I think a lot of people that I've heard from are energized by the fact that she's like really into pushing this forward um, and not using that as an excuse. Um, but people are still saying that it's probably going to be closer to 2023 where, you know, cannabis is sold in New York, where people were saying it was going to happen next year. Um, and obvious obviously if that happens, you know, on its face, it's bearish, you know, so, okay, we're not getting cannabis for like longer time, right. but I, I still think that the positive sentiment is there. It might take longer, you know, I, I don't think anybody knows at this point. Uh, um, in New Jersey also, I'm not as up to date on what's happening in, in New Jersey, but I know that they're suffering from regulatory kind of, you know, roadblocks, um, but it's all happening. You right, know, like right, we've right. talked about this a lot. Like we're in the first inning, how everybody says it. And we are, you know, like we're in the latter half of the first inning maybe, but like 
it's all still going to happen. And so maybe Chuck Schumer tweeting that cannabis is going to be legalized and then nothing comes of it. Yeah, maybe people like it definitely pisses people off and it's annoying and, and maybe it puts us two steps back. But I think the people that are really following the industry know that the savior is not going to be Chuck Schumer no. and the salvation is not going to be federal federal legalization. No. It's going to be a slow and steady buildup while the social equity component is being worked out and figured out and implemented in the way that it should be um, and not always the way that it's promised, but the way that it should be. Uh, I like all these things need to be figured out, you know, and we've been having this conversation with Alan Brockstein, read it in transcript form, uh, <laughs> and Julian Lin, who we had on the next week, we were talking about, you know, how the longer legalization takes really the better it is for investors and for these companies, they get to build up their operations, they get to understand how how to really grow and scale a cannabis company. And they're able to consolidate for a lower price, because there's a lot of companies that are on sale right now. And the smart ones have already been buying them up. You know, the smart ones have already been doing it. Yeah. Um, and, and then we saw like with Tilray, there's still things to come. Like Tilray just got into MedMen. Like, what does that mean? You know, like, yeah, I think everybody was like boohooing on MedMen. And, and it's interesting to see like what will happen. Cause like being on the West coast, MedMen doesn't look like a great stock, but it's certainly got a name in the space, you know, and it's known as a so it's interesting to think about how all these things happen and how some things can be turned around. And, um, and again, it's just, it, to me, the, the, the number one thing to look at is the, the fundamentals, just like the, the real things, not the headlines, not the PR stuff, not the you know, promised you know, down the line things that are gonna happen, but really what's actually happening. And if you look at what's actually happening, just related to the cannabis world, it's super, you know, um, encouraging, I think. I totally agree. Yeah. Just sit back and see what is in motion and yeah. come on, like manage expectations. Like this is yeah. not going to happen overnight, right? At all. Like it's impossible for it to happen overnight. There are so many variables in place. Um, like you said, the social equity component, the regulation component. I mean, pulling back all of these layers of prohibition for the past hundred years is going to take time. Um, I know that a lot of people were disappointed um, or, you know, not as impressed with the first draft of the bill that was presented by Chuck Schumer and, you know, myself included, but look, it's a first step, right? That's why they call it a draft. And that's kind of what Brady Cobb uh, echoed when I had him on, on the podcast previously is that, look, it's not going to be perfect the first time, but this is our opportunity to, to provide our input, to work with them and to really, you know, massage this bill into the right way that, that kind of fits what everybody's wanting it to look like. Right. And so we'll get there. It's just, like you said, stay focused, look at the fundamentals. There's going to be a lot of, of fear mongering out there in the media and, and even within the social media channels. Right. And so you just got to stay focused. That's yeah. really what it comes down to. Fear mongering and it's opposite, you know, like abject cheerleading, you know, you right. got to look into that also, you know, True. there's a lot of, and, and I'm saying that to myself. I mean, don't just listen to what I have to say, you know, like, I've made wrong calls or, or maybe calls that aren't turning out how I thought it was, you know, like case in point, the parent company, I still believe that it can turn itself around, but there's been a lot of disappointing news out of that stock. You know, I don't have all the answers. You don't have all the answers. Nobody, Todd Harrison doesn't have all the answers. Chuck Schumer doesn't, nobody has all the answers, right. you know, right. you gotta, you've got to do that work and you've got to kind of ingest it in the best way that you know how, and yeah, do the best you can. But yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of a lot of upside still out there. For and, sure. you know, I think the upside that may have been promised when, you know, the stocks were shooting through the roof kind of like a few months ago, well, like, look what's happening just on the promise, just on a few states going legal and the promise of further federal legal, look what's happening. Right. But that's not investing. Investing isn't just this. Otherwise, everybody would be in it. And that's it day trading, right? That's day that's trading. That's right, my friend. You know it is. That's I've, right. I've heard you say that several times. So it's it's lock and key in here now. You know, I got it. I'm doing something. I'm doing something. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you mentioned the the consolidation efforts that are happening right now, right? And and some of these big larger MSOs are are buying these these companies at a discount, right? So. I, I know that TrueLeave is one acquiring Harvest Health. Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. 
So that's, yeah. that's, what are your thoughts there? I know you're a big true leave fan as am I. So like, what does that mean? I know that right. Harvest Health, their, their majority of their kind of operations are in Arizona. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely an Arizona play, um, but they're in a, a couple of other states as well. Um, I, you know, I like it. I think on its, on its, on, on face value, it seems like a smart play, like a way to get some good, um, you know, uh, facilities, you know, without having to pay like a steep price. It's obviously like a good state to be in. I think it's a nice way to get in there. Um, similar to how I think Tilray was smart to, I mean, again, you know, things will bear the, it, it will be borne out but I think it's a smart way to get into California and different states like is through MedMen, you know? I think that's very smart and, and a, a nice way to approach it and probably surprise a lot of people. It surprised me for sure. Um, and yeah, I look at True Leaf Harvest Health the same way, a, a few of them, you know, I think a, a few of them have made smart acquisitions. I think it's the way to go. Um, I think the top MSOs will start buying the next tier and then the next tier will buy, you know, and it will just be kind of like this, natural um evolution into who kind of gets the biggest and the smartest you know i would say but it's definitely the way it's going i mean the smart operators are buying up the smaller ones and the best operators will keep feeding into each other you know mm -hmm. like medmen i think has a lot to offer it suffered from really poor management but i think it has a lot of nice things that it can offer Harvest Health also, I think, had some missteps, but it has a, it has a lot of nice things to offer, especially in the state that it's in. Um, right. Yeah, I like it. I like I like Kim buying more shares. I like that kind of trend also. Um, I think it it it, it, sh it proves that that we're not the only you know optimistic ones out there. I think a lot of the leaders are too, and that's being borne out, which is encouraging. Right. And, and to, to be a shareholder this early in the game is just exciting. Right. I mean, just, just Absolutely. like to just see this consolidation happen and to be part of it. And then, I mean, cause ultimately, at least in, in my view, I envision like the ultimate consolidation is going to be once we kind of know who the top MSOs are after this consolidation period, years down the road, it's going to be like, well, what big pharma is going to be purchasing these MSOs? Or, I mean, that's what I always thought, like what big CPG or pharma or tobacco or alcohol, you know, who's who's going to buy the big, but you know, who knows if that's the way it's going to go, you know, like maybe yeah. these companies get really big, like who knows how long it takes, like does interstate commerce happen? Maybe it doesn't happen. Maybe it does happen. What does that mean? You know, like there are so, <clears throat> excuse me, so many variables that are completely impossible to predict. So who knows? I mean, I think, you know, it's it's funny that you say that it's nice to be in at the beginning because it is. It's like fun and exciting and also like can be really anxiety inducing because like <laughs> I feel that way with the parent company. Like I don't even look anymore at the parent company. <laughs> it's, it's been rough. I know, it's depressing. <laughs> it's depressing. But I do feel like there's still something there, you yeah. know, and I feel like it's maybe nothing happens with that specific company. But what happens with that narrative? How does California play out like? Is it is it is it more about wholesale than dispensaries? We had Julian Lynn talking about that last week, um, which I think is a great point. Um, yeah, so I think it's 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 in some ways too early to tell exactly what's happening, but I also feel like long term, for the people paying attention, I think you can see what's what's happening. Yeah, exactly. If you have that long term mindset, it's it's a lot easier to log into your brokerage account every day yeah. and just kind of. Yeah. You don't worry about the day to day because again, it goes back to day trading versus investing. Investing, <laughs> and also to call it back to our earlier like meta human point about having perspective. It's it's another way to get just kind of click out a wider lens. You know, like don't look at that brokerage company like crap. I have no money today because if you're not selling, nothing's happened. You know, mm -hmm. but think about like, do I still believe in the story? Do I still believe in this thesis? If you don't, maybe you should get out. But if you do, you know, or if you're, if you're, uh, if you're up to date and feeling good, then then stay. You know, like that's anyways how I'm trying to think about it. <laughs> sure. No, absolutely. And I know you're very uh, transparent when it comes to your 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 portfolio and what you're long in, right? And so, have you added to your portfolio? Are there any companies that you're really looking at that uh, that are appealing? Like, what's that looking like? So it's a great question. So it's, I have not added to my personal portfolio, but Seeking Alpha started an investing competition 
uh, like a nice. couple months ago. So that's kind of, instead of real money, that's where I've been playing. <laughs> um, and I wanted to keep it totally cannabis focused. And right now it looks like crap, obviously, but <laughs> as I've kind of shouted out to my colleagues and cohorts, like, just you wait, just you wait. I don't know how long this competition is going on. It could be that it gets, you know, it truncates my, my goal of winning, but I do feel like however long the term, you know, that's, that's still my way to go. So if I was adding to my personal portfolio, I think probably some of the names I would add are like Merimed, Planet, uh, Planet 13, um, <clears throat> Terra Send. I think those are three that are like just doing great things, reporting great numbers, um, and, and look like they really can do something out there and, and, and not reflected in the share price. Right. That internal competition with, with, with you going all in on cannabis reminds me of the, uh, the tortoise and the hare race. It's like, don't you worry. It's got, it's coming yeah. at the, when it comes to the end, <laughs> I got be knocking you. on this shell. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. awesome. That's really cool. I eventually, I think, uh, cause I know parents, I have friends, uh, that are parents and with their younger kids that are, of course, when they're old enough they're they do like internal um investing competitions as well just like that oh, awesome. you know so that's something that i think that would be cool to incorporate uh one day when i'm a, a parent so I'm gonna that's really that awesome mind. that's really yeah. cute yeah absolutely that's a great I that's a great idea i know i was gonna say i wish somebody had done that with me when i was younger that's awesome <laughs> I know me too. Right. I wish a lot of the things that like skills that we needed to learn today as an adult, like weren't taught at all in the curriculum of like elementary, middle school and high school, which is, no. you know, like a basic like tax class would be nice or a basic like finance class of like, okay, you have a budget, you need groceries, you need that, like all that kind of stuff, I think would be very valuable for our youth today. I, I really feel, I always used to say that like parents should need to like get a certificate before becoming a parent. Like you should <laughs> need to do something before you just get a kid. And I, I as I grow older, I feel like we should also have to like pass a class to be an adult. Like you don't just be an adult because you're 18 or you're 21 or you're 30. Like you got to do some shit. You got to understand some shit. You can't just like go out there like throwing spaghetti against a wall and hoping it sticks. Like I didn't know how to do taxes. I didn't know how to fill out forms. I didn't know how to balance a check. Like Right. I, you know, all of that stuff. I didn't learn any of that. You know, it was all self-taught with a ton of mistakes and a ton of like, and a ton of like, yeah, I can invest. I know how to invest. You know, like you oh. really have to like build ourselves up where like, I feel like, yeah, it definitely, we should be having life classes. For sure. Yeah. And with investing with me, I'm still learning. Like I started, like I mentioned mm -hmm. in 2018. So I'm still super new to the game and these conversations with you are invaluable, obviously. And then listening to your podcast, the Cannabis Investing Podcast is super beneficial uh, as it relates to the cannabis financial market. So, I mean, you can do it if you apply yourself and I'm by no means an expert. I'm still learning every single day, right? No one, no one knows it all, um, yeah. but you just got to apply yourself I, I, in this day and age, right? Because if you wait around, uh, it's not going to happen. That's right. You're not going to get a life course. You can no. wait as long as you want, but you're not going to get one. You got to, right. you got to give that course to yourself. Right. Exactly. Well, <laughs> who, who else do you have coming up? Like who have you talked to recently on your podcast? Anything worth uh, that was super interesting or like upcoming episodes that you're excited about? Well, I'll talk to you one that I did last week that I was thinking about when you were saying about your, your friends that have kids and they're teaching them about investing. So I interviewed Brian Sicandi, who is doing two really cool things. He started this um, site called Careers Cannabis, and it's just like a better way to uh, recruit for the cannabis industry. Um, it was the first job search engine for cannabis in North America. So he's like a trailblazer in the scene. And also just like how he's trying to do it, like all the crap that you've heard of, you know, that people have, have talked about on your show. I've heard it on my show, you know, just like the ugly side of the cannabis industry and like gross hiring practices and gross recruiting strategies um, and gross payouts, you know, to like the executives that don't really, you know, all of those things. Right. So he's trying to kind of prevent that from happening, improve it, which I think on its own is just totally awesome and, and yeah. amazing. Um, and then to kind of like, and which I think speaks to kind of like what we're both trying to do in our own way, which is like build something of our own and grow it. 
So he was saying he's trying to grow this career's cannabis and a way of getting it out there, he decided, and he's also always wanted to write a book. So he wrote this children's book um, called Kids and Cannabis. Wow. And it's told from, it's like an illustrated children's book. And it's told from the point of view of, of children talking about how their parents work in cannabis and what they do and explaining. And there's like a glossary of terms in the, in the back. Um, and so I feel like extremely, extremely inspired by, by what Brian is doing. Like a, he kind of sees something in the industry, wants to write it, wants to make it better, wants to improve it. But sure. then also just like from a business perspective, like ways of thinking about things like, oh, I have this website, so I can only do something that has to, you know, like, but no, like you can kind of like go over here and do something like a little bit creative also that has to do with it and just kind of expose yourself to a completely new, I mean, the only way I know about him is through this book. You know, I wouldn't have probably known about him just from careers cannabis. So sure, I just thought that was, I found myself extremely, extremely inspired for like days um, about that. So I think that's really awesome. Yeah, no, that's out of the box thinking. I mean, I always yeah. tip, tip my hat to people that go above and beyond like the way in which to get their message out, right? Like yeah. you mentioned right there, he, he's he got that startup careers in cannabis. Well, why not speak or, or share content from the perspective of a child whose parents are in cannabis, right? Because that's happening more and more and more every single day, right? We're seeing um, not only the legacy uh, operators kind of continue to thrive and, and whatnot, but people from the outside, from different industries are piling in, right? So, yeah. uh, and I, oh, that's one question that I always ask my guests that come from, you know, another other side of the house is like, well, what was your, like, what was the reaction from your peers, right? Like, what were you mm -hmm. thinking if you're not, a, mm -hmm. if you weren't a consumer, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of them, like, even if they're not consumers are like, well, I know, I know the efficacy of this plant, right? Like I understand the, the health value. I understand the, the, the therapeutic value of cannabinoids. And so if you could just get to that point, right, all that stigma, those barriers just break. And so we'll get there, you know, it's just, it's, yeah. it just comes down to education really. <clears throat> we'll get, you know, it's funny. Like it does totally come down to education. Sometimes I feel like we're right there. Like, it seems like, yeah, we're getting rid of the stigma. Like what, you know, kind of what more needs to be done. And it's funny, like through CEO interviews, um, one of the person, one of the people that we have doing the interviews, like works in the cannabis industry. And we've had companies be like, they, he can't interview our company because we can't be affiliated with cannabis. I'm like, what? Wow. But you're not yeah. affiliated with cannabis, like literally in any way, shape or form. Like, it's like, I'm like, what that, and that, that didn't just happen one time. And I'm like, shock. And I try and kind of like bring, kind of like think to myself, like, wait, you stand for something. What do you want to stand for in this moment? Don't just reply like, that sucks. Talk to you later. You know, <laughs> like, so I try and always say something like kind of how ridiculous that is in a very nice way, you know, like it's legal in most states and, you know, whatever. There are so many reasons to call it as ridiculous, but it's also, I think, important to recognize that it's still out there and it's like, in the main, in the really mainstream world, there's still like, I mean, it depends kind of where you are and who you're talking to, but, but there's definitely like a big section that it's still a taboo. It's still a stigma. I keep looking at that reefer madness thing that you have behind you. <laughs> like the perfect call to, you know, I know. For those for those that aren't seeing video, what Rena's talking about, I haven't done it yet. So I I purchased three vintage Reefer Madness posters. So Sweet. I have all the the three that were part of that time, and I need to just get them framed, and I'm gonna put them in the back as like the backdrop eventually, um, as I love again it. enhance the production value of the podcast. But I appreciate that. Yeah, I love those posters. It's it, they were at a a store or a shop right near where we live. And I was like, I'm not passing these up. Like I got to get them. Yeah. And, and they're awesome. so ridiculous. Like you should see <clears throat> so ridiculous. what they say on these, like the sweet pill that makes life bitter. Women cry for it. Men die for it. Reefer <laughs> madness, drug crazed abandoned. And then you got this poor woman in the bottom corner that looks like a zombie um you know i just hashtag propaganda hashtag propaganda is hashtag right. racially biased propaganda so speaking of the stigma that still exists uh rena you'll appreciate this i recently had on um a woman by the name of aubrey adams 
mm-hmm. who is part of the 8% of Americans who are against cannabis legalization. They're pro prohibition. Good for and, you. That's awesome, dude. That's awesome. I mean, why not? Right. So yeah, like, that's awesome. I, I've said it before. Like I, I'm, I'm always, I'm about discussion and dialogue. The, pro- the problem that I see a lot with today is that People are so set in their view here and their view there and you're wrong and you're wrong. No, you don't know what you're talking about. And there's no even coming to the table of like, well, why do you think that way? Why, where, where is this coming from? Right. And so with me, I hadn't had anybody on the prohibition side on yet. And it's just been efficacy, this, that, I mean, we talk about adverse effects as well, of course, because I want to be objective but really somebody hard pressed on the other side. And I got to tell you, it was, it was an interesting experience. Like, you know, she, she primarily, and I don't want to speak for her, but from her background and her title, she primarily comes from the child side of it, right? The adolescent side of cannabis use. And of course, children's brains are still developing. And if you're predisposed to different, um, you know, illnesses or like uh, schizophrenia and whatnot, it just can't, it doesn't help. Right. So we talked a little bit about that, but I really wanted to get into like the adult side of it, right? Like, okay, let's get past the, the child part. Cause we both agree that they're underage. They shouldn't be doing it because it's, it's yeah. illegal. Right? Yeah. I don't think anyone, nobody's pushing for like, no, underage. Yeah, yeah, not at all. And, and, yeah. you know, so when we got into the discussion of, of adults, I mean, it's just a lot of like, you know, they, like, she really felt like, you know, no, it is a detriment. It is harmful. You know, there are side effects. My husband experienced things, my son, and I get that those are all personal experiences, but to, to blanket it, you know, to everyone, I just, I don't understand that mindset. And so it was long story short, it was a really good discussion. Um, it didn't get disrespectful at all. Right. We were very respectful to one another. Um, but it's just, they firmly believe that, that cannabis is the worst substance ever. Right. And I, and when I brought up examples of like alcohol or even sugar, right. Like sugar is an, is an external (laughs) substance that could kill you. Right. It's um, it, it, there's just this hyper-focus and um, an attack on cannabis, you know, from or what about like the fact that it like, you know, uh, replaces opioids in a lot of instances and like places where cannabis is legal, the opioid death is like significantly lowered. Right. Yeah. I mean, I brought that up and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great proof point, but I think what she, I I brought up the example to her. I said, uh, you know, we were talking, I gave her the example of like, say we we come into a a vet, a veteran, right. And he's suffering from PTSD. He or she is suffering from PTSD trauma from going overseas on on a tour or whatever. And like now he's an alcoholic, right. Or now he's, or he or she is addicted to opioids. What, what, what do we say when, you know, he's, he or she has found cannabis and it's a better therapeutic alternative. And her response was, well, I wouldn't suggest he or she to play Russian roulette with anything, you know, like, and so that to me is unrealistic. Like for you to say just cold Turkey, you know, you don't need any of it. Like, yeah, that that's so not fair in my eyes because like all of us deal with different shit and we all have different things going on and all our body chemistry is different and whatnot. And to just kind of say, Hey, well, just, just deal with it and be better. I don't know if that's the right answer. And if there are alternatives that are more beneficial and, and, and healthier for you and, and give you a more sustainable way of living, then why not entertain that? You know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you know, for me, it goes hand in hand, like everything that we've been discussing, like in terms of like the meta, the human level and this, like it, what you were saying about how you feel like everything is so divided and people are so divided. Like, I think, first of all, there's too much division. And I think sometimes we take our own personal experience and use that as a test case for like how everybody should be. So like, just because like I've experienced something or my sister or my child or my parent, that doesn't mean that you're going to, it doesn't mean that your parent or child or sibling is going to experience that. So like, I feel like we could all do with a big, huge dollop of empathy. And I feel like everything, like how people deal with COVID, like it's not a one, one size fits all approach. Like 
there's reason to like question things like from start to finish. And there's like overwhelming reason to be empathetic to like our fellow human being. Cause like we all are struggling in some way. So like, if this helps you and you're telling me that, who am I to say, no, it doesn't. Or who am I to say, well, you should be, you know, like, it's just like, I feel like everybody should be able to be on their own like path of life. And just like, man, can we just like be a little, I know it's like so trite, but like, seriously, I'm just like so discouraged by so many like divisions and they're just I feel like there doesn't need to be so many divisions yeah it makes me sad when I'm with a group of friends like close friends and if even if we have different viewpoints um like the fact that some topics like like we can't even bring up like and it's not that it's like it's not that like somebody puts the rule like don't do it but there's this like unspoken rule of like let's not talk about that or let's not bring and I, that bothers me so much because how do we progress as a human race if we can't even have a discussion about something, right? Like if we can't even talk, it's that highly stigmatized that you can't even bring it up because somebody's emotions are going to get out of whack. But it's like control your emotions, right? Like I'm not attacking you. I'm not telling you what to think, but we should all be respectful enough to listen to one another and consider each other's viewpoints, even if they're crazy, right? Like I can listen I can listen to Aubrey and I can hear her talk and I respect that she has that viewpoint, but I don't need to agree with her. I don't need to like, you know, but we're all human. Right. And we, I think we all deserve that level of respect to be heard, you know? And and I think like probably having her on your podcast, like taught you a lot about patience, about understanding where you're coming from on a deeper level. Like, even if you guys didn't change each other's minds, like, I'm sure you were both changed by that encounter in some way, you know, like totally. maybe you don't even see it now, but you, like I, it all kind of like, um, I think if you're putting the work in, like you're trying to be um, more holistic in your approach and like talking to people instead of just like, nope, you're anti-cannabis, like this isn't the place for you. Like that's not, what is that going to do? You know, like the only thing that is going to like do anything productive is like dialoguing and it doesn't mean obviously you solve everything. Like it's, there's still going to be those problems, but I just think our approach serves us as individuals a lot more than, you know, not approaching um, or kind of just like putting up roadblocks wherever we can. Totally. And then, you know, the last point I want to say for those listening is not that like, okay. And not to, you know, I'm not saying you be so understanding that you just give them the floor. And it's like, you know, what I'm saying is that like, hold them accountable where data, if you can back it up with data, then of course do that, right? Like the right information needs to be out there, but just the unwillingness to listen at all, I think is, is not a good thing, right? Like we should at least give that level of respect. And so, I mean, will I do it again? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I've got to find the right candidate to do it. I, I would really, I've talked about this before. I'd like to have some type of you know, formal debate where we actually have like scientists on where we can really dive into these, these, these data findings, these peer review studies and talk to somebody on the left, on the prohibition side and on the, you know, pro cannabis side and just kind of come together. People that are smarter than me, basically, you know, that, that, uh, that can really have these, these knowledgeable conversations, but it was, it was really cool. It was a good experience. What I took from it was that Um, people have, like you said before, you nailed it, Rena, it's that people have personal experiences. And sometimes that clouds how they feel and what they perceive for others. And that's kind of the takeaway that I got is that this poor woman, I mean, she, she did have issues with her with her son, you know, when it came to dabbing and and what whatnot, And, and her husband, I think, you know, is away now and stuff so from her perspective, I understand where she comes from, right? Do I disagree? Do I agree that that's how it is for everyone? No course not right right? but it was uh it was good it was interesting who can you say who you have upcoming next as guests or is that a secret well well I have some guests upcoming that I can announce I have uh Tim Seymour coming on again from CNBC who's awesome who has like a lot of tremendously insightful things to say um about cannabis I have a company 180 Life Sciences which is really a scientific company, like they're basing all of their findings on science and Rafael Mishulam, who's the founder of THC and Israeli professor. Um, he's one of their 
um, he's one of their co-founders and just like a, a huge medical background. So I'm excited to get them on a very different perspective than I'm used to bringing on, like very, very heady from the science side. Um, but I found it super interesting. Nice. Um, and look, I am reluctant because this interview hasn't happened yet. It's supposed to happen in a couple of days. I've kind of taught myself to not say anything unless an interview is actually in the can. <laughs> so I don't want to say it, but it's one of my most exciting interviews that I've had. It's with a government figure from Israel. I'll put it like that. Ooh. And uh, hopefully I'll have that out soon. Yeah, it's very exciting for me. Good for um, you. Nice. Yeah, yeah. And then in a couple of weeks, actually, I had another really fun, exciting interview with uh, Jim Belushi from Belushi Farms. They just did a deal with Grow Generation. Um, so that was like a real thrill to get to talk to them just like on a personal fan level because I'm a Chicago girl and Jim Belushi's like such a Midwestern guy and Blues Brothers and he's about to perform again with Dan Aykroyd. So that was like a real thrill and also super interesting, um, kind of like similar to what I was asking you, like, how do you scale a small farm, you know, and now they have Grow Generation partnering with them. So kind of an interesting, uh, I think, approach. But yeah, those are those are some of the exciting things that we have coming down the pike. Talking to Belushi, I'm, I'm working to get him on. Um, so hopefully that he's comes a fun. To he's a fun fruition. interview. He I, he seems like it. I mean, I would yeah. just love to just sit with that guy. He just brings such this positive, cool vibe energy to the to the, you know, anywhere he goes, it seems like. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that would make for a good conversation. So I'll definitely be on the lookout for those once they release. That's exciting awesome. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There's like interviews that I've had where I like wish that I was live in person with the person I'm talking to. And that was definitely one of them. He's like, like a super fun, you know, super funny guy. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. And he, you mentioned he's going to perform. Is he, he's performing at MJ Unpacked in October, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that's yeah. That's our exciting. episode will be launching pretty soon before that uh, MJ Unpacked. Are you going to Vegas? Are you are you going to any of those uh, conventions? That was the plan. Um, I need to see if I can make it happen. I I, I got to apologize to uh, George Jage because I did record with him to talk about mm -hmm. MJ Unpacked, mm -hmm. and I had technical issues on Zoom, and literally like it only recorded seven minutes of that episode. So he's the only guy that hasn't been able to be published of, you know, of the recordings that I've done. So I'm, I'm with his PR person. Hopefully we can get it rescheduled, but we were in talks about me going out there and doing some type of on-site podcast. Um, oh, that's awesome. But you know, I, I haven't <laughs> produced the episode yet. So it, let's see if it, that offer is still on the table, but we'll, we'll get that done. And again, apologies to, uh, to George, because that was not uh, on purpose. That was not intended. And in the meantime, you can listen to his great episode on the cannabis investing podcast. I also talked to George a few weeks ago. Yeah. There you awesome. go. See, yeah. so you have, yeah. you have uh, Rena's episode for now. Yeah. yeah. To, to whet your appetite. There you go. Um, that's <laughs> really, that's really cool though. I like that as an idea. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be cool. I mean, just, you know, getting the name out, um, walk bys if, if there's industry leaders that just want to sit and chat for five, 10 minutes, you totally. know? Uh, so yeah, we'll see. Are you, are you planning to go out there? I don't think so. Um, I kind I really want to, my daughter is like having a graduation ceremony from where she is like on October 25th and it would just be too crazy for me to get back here in time. Um, yeah. And my brother's giving birth, my brother's partner is giving birth like a month before that. So it's just uh, it's too crazy. I can yeah. tell you all more about that. It's like, if you guys want to know, but uh, yeah, my schedule, <laughs> it just, it doesn't seem like it's lining up. Um, I, I really you. want, I really, really, really wanted it to. And I, a big part of me still wants it to, but it doesn't look like it's probably going to happen in reality. Um, but it would be exciting. So, so what else do you have going on? Who else do you have coming on? Who do I have? Okay, so I have I talked to Fabian Monaco. Uh, oh obviously. yeah, from Gage. Yeah, I saw that. President of Gage, second time he's been on. It was a great conversation. We really got into uh, deep dive into like company performance, their Q2 earnings report, um, their exclusive partnership with Cookies, just all the great, amazing things that Gage is doing to set their foothold in Michigan. So. That was a really great um, conversation. And then I also talked with recently, and these are all completed. I just need to get them published. Uh, Alan Gandelman, president. Oh, I of, talked to him. Yeah. Man, that guy is fun to talk to. He's, Smart AF. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's yeah. so awesome. And we just had a really great conversation. It was really all over the board. I mean, 
you know, everything from New York hemp to New, uh, New York cannabis, um, obviously what we talked about earlier in terms of actually um, getting sales online. I think that you said they're projecting now to 2023. So, you know, his thoughts on, on what, they, what they did right, what they did in, in, in terms of regulation and uh, his thoughts on social equity, which were very, very interesting. I think he made some really good points there at the federal level. Uh, it was just a really great conversation. Really liked the guy. He's fun. Um, yeah. And then yeah. lastly, I talked to Brett Hy- uh, Heyman, founder of Flower by Eddie Parker. So that was cool because it was this, you know, the discussion really centered around the convergence or the combination of fashion and cannabis and what, what they're doing uh, at Flower by Eddie Parker. So that was interesting. And then lastly, Dr. Tim Shu. Uh, he's a veterinarian and he focuses specifically on CBD for pets. Oh, nice. Uh, so we really got into the science of, of, you know, cannabinoid therapeutics for um, animals with vertebrates. Cause I think he said most animals with vertebrates have endocannabinoid systems, if not all of them. So they're similar to us in that way. So there is a lot of therapeutic value uh, for cannabis and hemp uh, as it relates to pets. So those were all interesting. And then lastly, this is upcoming, but I mean, I have a lot, but I'll call this one out because you mentioned Alan. Alan Brockstein will be coming on uh, in the next week or two uh, from New Cannabis Ventures. And so that'll be a great conversation. Alan's awesome. He's, I really feel like for me, one of the top few analysts in in the cannabis industry. He's awesome. Yeah, he's he's... Fun. Seems very knowledgeable, very approachable guy. So um, looking forward to picking his brain, you know, just hearing what he's seeing from the front lines. Absolutely. I was going to say, I actually listened to your first interview with Fabian from Gage before I interviewed him. It was great. It was a great uh, episode. And I was going to say that Gage is probably another stock I would add to that list of if I was going to be adding a stock to my list right now. It looks, I mean, that market looks awesome. They seem very smart uh like really well operated you know yeah i totally agree yeah and i i am uh, i will say i am a shareholder of gauge and, oh, nice. and have not been disappointed especially through these rough times i mean they've they've seemed to be pretty stable in their share price so shout out to fabian thank you for the swag i just got some gauge swag <laughs> nice. yesterday so that was cool. nice 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 yeah. wait what else are you in since last we talked and what do you mean like stocks oh uh let me pull it up not to put you on the spot or anything. Of course, no, no, no. I'm actually, I'm, I'm just chipping away. I'm, I'm watching and chipping away. Give me one. That's second. the smart way to go. I'm gonna log in right now and I'll tell you. All right. So I mentioned Gage. I also uh, bought in on some Juicy. Nice. Juicy holding. That's another good. That's another good wreck. Yep. Tilt Holdings, very impressed with uh, what Gary's doing at Tilt. I think that they actually just um, announced a partnership with a Native American reservation, uh, which is really cool. That's so cool. who else? I do. I, I am long Planet 13, like you mentioned. Oh, I recently bought Forefront Ventures as well. Nice. And I talked with uh, the CEO there. I'm blanking on his name right now. I apologize. Um, but, you know, based off of my discussion with him, um, sounded like they were, you know, they had, they had their shit together, basically. So That's awesome. Wait, did you get out of the parent company? Were you, you were in that, right? No, I'm still in it. I, I, don't, in it. I didn't have like a, total, like a ton of shares. I just kind of was dipping my toes in with that one. So mm-hmm. I'm still holding. It's not like a big loss at this yeah. point, but wow, it's at 370 now. Oh, it's obscene. Yeah. It, that's, it's obscene. Also, Glasshouse is like at four or something. That's another one that I, that's Mercer Park now, right? It was Mercer Park. The Mercer Park was the SPAC and now it's Glasshouse. Now it's Glasshouse. Okay. So that's what I need to buy. I know that's on my watch list, but I don't have that yet. Agrify has been Agrify. killing it. Yes, yes. Agrify and Flora Growth are doing insane numbers since they went public. We had both their CEOs on CEO interviews. Yeah, I would check those. I would check both of them out also. Immediately. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I got in at a really good price early on because I had I had one of their execs on. God, it's been so long. I feel bad not remembering all these names. I have to go back. 
but um, it was a good conversation. They're doing really great stuff. They're more in like the lighting. Vertical farming. Yeah, vertical farming yeah. space. Yeah, yeah. And um, the gentleman that I talked to, if I could remember, he mentioned to me that like his background was in uh, the entertainment space prior. So mm -hmm. like he, he was charged with building one of the largest indoor cultivation grows, not, not for cannabis, but regular plants for a, um, a movie that they shot. And so oh, really, that's cool. Like when I was talking to him, his virtual background on zoom was that indoor grow. So, um, that was pretty right. cool. Yeah. Yeah. There it's, it's the whole, I we've interviewed like a few, um, vertical farming companies like app harvest. Um, but it's super interesting. I mean, especially vis-a-vis -vis cannabis, like what it can do and, and they're, I mean, stock is like taking off. It's taking off yeah yeah they've been they've been killing it so that's been fun to watch uh you know compared to the the rest of the red on the portfolio yeah, exactly. but hey we're yeah. long though we're long so it's okay yeah, man. we're in it for the <laughs> long haul also that's right yeah i feel like vertical farming and flora growth like growing cannabis like in columbia they're interesting things to think about clever leaves also there's a number of companies but yeah i feel like those are two things outside of kind of just the US centric picture are interesting to think about. I was so bullish on Clever Leaves. Uh, and then I stopped. I haven't even, I haven't even seen where they're at now. <laughs> and, then I'm, and then I wasn't. <laughs> but I believe in their model. Like they're, they're totally outside the US. And I, I believe, correct if I'm wrong, Karina, but they're really focused on the, like, what's the, what's the, like the, the cost effective flower, right? Or the yeah, cost exactly. effective. Yeah. 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 Same with flora growth. Yeah. They're trying to like, you know, the, the cheapest, I forget what he said. It was uh, the interviews coming out Tuesday on CEO interviews with flora growth. Um, I don't want to say the wrong number, but like what it cost the cost, you know, per gram is like insanely. So I think it's 50% less or something like in Colombia. Um, right. Yeah. It's a really interesting model. And just in terms of like the return they've gotten so far, it's been really interesting to see. I wasn't necessarily expecting that. Yeah, well, that's one that I'm definitely gonna have to put back on my radar because I'm a I'm a fan of uh, Kyle Detweiler. He he mm -hmm. seems like a pretty sharp dude coming from BlackRock. Mm -hmm. So he does, yeah, he does, yeah, he does. Seems like a smart operator. Absolutely. Well, Rena, is there anything we've been talking for over an hour, and this is your Sunday? I know, so I do want to. Well, be the truth is, I'm. Okay, I'm usurping time. your weekend and Israel Sunday's a work day. So there's no apology necessary for me. <laughs> well, I would I be slogging that. away anyways. <laughs> yeah. The work never stops. Right. I mean, go on, I let's don't. be real. Yeah. I don't. Well, what do you want to leave the, uh, the audience with words of wisdom <laughs> from herbal Sherbel? Er very nice callback, my friend. Very nice <laughs> callback. Um, well, I would like to start off with thanking you for, for coming on because it's always a joy and a pleasure. And it really, um, for me is really nice, like a, as a fellow podcaster to talk to somebody and to like, you know, just kind of like vibe off of what we're going through and share our insights from the cannabis industry and being a human in this world. Um, I always really enjoy talking to you. So thanks for having me on and thanks for sharing your audience with me. Um, and then just kind of like in general, I think we talked about so much stuff. I mean, I don't think we left anything out. We really hit a lot of, of really nice points. I would say if we're going to leave it on anything, just kind of like what we were emphasizing before, which I think uh, we're both trying to do in our own way. And probably most people listening to this are trying to do in their own way. And just may we all be doing more of it, like hearing people and listening and understanding and also being educated. So we have something thoughtful to say in response. It's not just about letting somebody steamroll you with their opinion, you know, like <laughs> right. thoughtful conversation, not just empty dialogue. Um yeah, let's all be doing more of that, you know, and kudos to you for the part you're playing with that. Well, thank you so much. The pleasure is mine. And that's very sound advice. I couldn't say it better myself. So Rena, it's a pleasure. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, I guess, working, but uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's do this again in the next month. We'll be better about getting it to be more uh, consistent, or at least I will. So absolutely. I'm here anytime for you, my friend. It was a joy and a pleasure. Appreciate it. Awesome. You rock, Rena. We all love you. The, the industry loves you. And uh, I, you. I love the audience. Thank you guys for listening. <laughs> love all you right. right back. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it. Bye, y'all.